Never in modern history has a war begun with so smashing a victory. In one hour and 50 minutes, the Japanese have sunk or shattered eight battleships. Oklahoma, West Virginia, Arizona, Nevada, California, Tennessee, Maryland, Pennsylvania. Three cruisers and three destroyers and four smaller ships are sunk or battered. So we unloaded this ammunition and the uh, driver took off with the truck and here we are with a pile of what then was highly classified stuff. So we took turns and uh, passed my, my weapon around. Each of us stood about two hours out in the rain. And now, a station having for its primary function The creation of the Naval Ordnance Test Station at China Lake was a matter of wartime necessity. Its continued existence following the drastic post-war drawdown was a matter of unusual foresight. Its phenomenal growth and unprecedented success in the decades that followed were matters of national importance. Described early on in the press as the Navy's secret city, it was hidden behind the address Knott's Inukern for about a decade. And even if some of its products were well known, the station itself remained largely hidden from the public and even from the vast majority of its customers in the fleet. An old army airstrip out in the middle of nowhere provided the cornerstone. And the story opened in early November 1943 with a college professor and his assistant huddled under a tin roof guarding a pile of prototype rockets with a 38 revolver. From that unlikely initiation arose the Navy's premier weapons research, development, test and evaluation center in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the war. The Second World War was, more than any before it, a war of technology. Scores of new devices, those secret weapons beloved by the writers of newspaper headlines, were being pursued by a novel mix of military, academic, and industrial experts under the umbrella of the Office of Scientific Research and Development. The ground-up creation of a full-spectrum center for the application of technology to immediate military needs was a massive and unprecedented endeavor. And the creation of China Lake, labs and ranges and air center and community was an endeavor comparable really only with its even more secret cousin, Los Alamos, an activity founded by some of the same people who had helped establish China Lake. Knott's was officially established on 8 November 1943 as a station having for its primary function the research, development and testing of weapons and having additional function of furnishing primary training in the use of such weapons. The name chosen in the East, the Naval Ordnance Test Station, carefully masked the true extent of the China Lake mission, and no open mention was made for many years of a significant and very secret sub-element of the Manhattan Project that was soon added to the station's mission. A complex undertaking, to say the least. China Lake was to develop and test weapons for the fleet and for the Marines. Big rockets for the smashing of the impossible concrete walls of Japanese pillboxes and massed rockets for the breaching of the bristling beach obstacles on both fronts. Rockets that fired backwards for attacking submarines. And rockets that fired forward for attacking planes, trains, trucks, and tanks. The rockets needed fire control. And launchers. Warheads and motors, too, which made explosives and propellants. And the means and methods for their manufacture in the massive quantities required to make an impact on a conflict of such unprecedented scale. And the pilots needed training, too, in the use of these new weapons, as did the Ordies and the crews. The test range needed an airfield, and that needed aircraft support facilities, and fuel farms, and supply yards, and barracks, and mess halls, and ship services. The place wasn't designed just for testing. It was designed for everything. Everything needed to conceive and design and develop and document and test and evaluate and ship out new things to the operators. And novelty meant laboratories, which needed machine shops and supply drops, calipers and balances and slide rules and magazines of every sort. And people to operate all that. And people to feed them and do their laundry and their typing and their pay stubs. And operate telephones too, and someday television someone to pump gas and fix the inevitable broken windows, to water the trees and lawns and baseball diamonds that help make the blazing Mojave summers at least tolerable so far from civilization. All those things, all those people, 
required to make a dirt scrabble test range into a full spectrum laboratory and an isolated outpost into a complete cohesive community. It would be a rather strange place, especially as military outposts go. Civilian scientists house next door to Navy pilots. Their technicians and tin vendors right down the street. They'd all shop at the commissary, and they'd belong to the same social clubs and play on the same teams. Their kids would go to the same schools, all of them on board. And on Saturday night, they'd dress for dinner and dance to the band at the officers club, or the chiefs club, or the AC Ducey, or the old Jolly Roger, wherever their military or civil service rank placed them. They'd advance their projects with over-the-fence discussions over a cold beer, and they'd create what would become known as the China Lake way of doing business. Creativity, initiative, competition, and not a little risk, in a full-spectrum laboratory dedicated to serving the fleet. And one day, every China Laker, from those who did a short tour with a tenant unit to those who spent five-plus decades dedicated to the lab, would be able to look back and say, we've been into just about everything at one time or another, from submarines to satellites, dumb bombs to smart bombs, small arms to side arms. But that's another story. <clears throat> By the summer of 1943, the United States Navy was aggressively aware of the military potential of rocketry. The California Institute of Technology was conducting the main rocket program of World War II. In charge of the effort was Dr. Charles Lauritsen, a dynamically pragmatic scientist with enormous energy. He had proposed and was actively seeking a large West Coast test area suitable for the expanding rocket program. Captain Sherman Burroughs, fresh from combat duty as commander of the Saratoga Air Group, had just been assigned to the research division of the Bureau of Ordnance. Being heavily motivated to improve the fleet's aviation ordnance, he saw the importance of rockets. He and Lauritsen formed a strong rapport and began a team effort to locate a Navy ordnance test site. In September of 1943, they were flying back to Pasadena after witnessing a series of Caltech rocket firings at Goldstone Dry Lake on an Army test range. With them was Captain James Burns, the head of Ordnance Station Administration for Buord. Lauritsen casually suggested a slight detour over the Mojave Desert for a survey of some territory he had spotted on a previous aerial search. For Lauritsen, it had been love at first sight and he was pleased to find that Burns and Burroughs had the same reaction. What they saw was the unused Inukern airstrip and the desolate dry bed of China Lake. The area appeared ideal for a rocket test site. Nearby were roads, water, power, telephone lines, and railheads. The region was virtually deserted, which minimized displacing inhabitants and maximized security. Burns rapidly communicated their joint enthusiasm to his superior, Rear Admiral William Blandy, Chief of Buord. Blandy saw beyond the pressing wartime needs and wanted the area as a permanent R&D center. Burroughs' main concern had been aviation ordnance, and Lauritsen wanted enough space to test the Caltech rockets. The charter that evolved for the proposed Naval Ordnance Test Station satisfied all three. But there was just one problem. The Army had commandeered much of the land for a bombing range. It was time for a game of military chess. Rear Admiral Mark Mitcher, combat exhausted from the Battle of Midway, had just been assigned temporary shore duty as the West Coast Fleet Air Commander. Mitcher's waning energy was stimulated by the challenge of the rocket program. Through persuasion and horse trading, he convinced the Army to relinquish their claim to the land. On the 8th of November, 1943, Frank Knox, the Secretary of the Navy, signed an order that officially gave birth to the new station. 
Burroughs requested and was granted the post of commanding officer. To help him with the unique problems of desert living, he chose Commander John Richmond for his exec. Under the vigorous direction of Captain Oscar Sandquist, the physical building of knots progressed at an unprecedented rate. The speed was accelerated by Burns in Washington, maintaining a swift flow of personnel, approvals, and cash. By February 1944, the station was ready for its first visit from the Chief of Buord. Rear Admiral George Hussey, Blandy's replacement, conducted what turned out to be a most inauspicious inspection. Thick clouds of wind-blown sand virtually obscured both the facilities and the rocket demonstrations. But Hussey's vision was sufficiently clear to see the enormous potential of both the station and the radically new weapon systems it would bring forth. Well, Admiral, considering the brevity of the presentation, have we missed anything important? You've caught the essence, but I think you should mention something about Deke Parsons and Dr. Tommy. They influenced all of us. Of course, you and some of the other founders served with them at the Naval Proving Grounds. That's when Thompson was chief scientist and Parsons was experimental officer. That's right. They were both pioneers in developing a good military-civilian relationship based on mutual respect. And they both saw the need for a great center like you have here today. Which explains Parsons' broad influence on Navy R&D and why Thompson became the first technical director of the Knott's team. That's the word, team. And that was really the spirit of the founding. Superior teamwork by all hands, scientists and military alike.
In the early 1940s, things weren't going very well for the United States or for freedom anywhere. Resources of all kinds were being mobilized. Military, industrial, scientific. Through the Office of Scientific Research and Development, a crash effort was being made to apply scientific knowledge to military problems. One segment was a rocket program conducted by California Institute of Technology under the direction of Dr. C. C. Lauritsen. At the Eaton Canyon facility in the foothills near Pasadena, fabrication of rockets was begun. By 1943, scientists from Caltech needed more room to test the rockets they were developing for the Navy. Another need was becoming apparent to forward-looking naval officers and civilian scientists. It was the need for continuous cooperation between the military and scientific communities to apply new technology in the solution of defense problems. Somewhere, it might be possible to meet both needs, a place to test things now and a place to build a research and development center for future defense needs. Such a place was found 155 miles northeast from Los Angeles in a vast, nearly deserted area. Eventually, the Navy city of China Lake would rise here. The area had space for tests, good flying weather, and few neighbors to complain about the noise. The Secretary of the Navy established the Naval Ordnance Test Station in Yokern, November 8, 1943. It was in this valley that headquarters would be located. This was the spacious quarters that served as bedroom and office for the military command team headed by Sherman Burroughs, the young Navy captain who was the first commanding officer. 25 years later, in 1968, the same valley looked this way. And this was the headquarters for what is now the Naval Weapons Center. This film reviews highlights of those 25 years. From this review, it may be easier to understand how effective weapons evolve and what is necessary to ensure that the nation has the best possible weapons to defend us. The early pace was frantic. Despite the primitive conditions, rockets developed by Caltech were tested and pilots were trained to use them. A forward-firing aircraft rocket, three and one-half inches in diameter, for use in anti-submarine warfare, was the first rocket to be tested on the Knotts ranges. Next came the four and a half inch barrage rockets, firepower to cover troops landing on a beachhead. Holy Moses, a five inch high velocity aircraft rocket was one of the most successful air-to-ground weapons. And for long-range beach attack, the five-inch spin-stabilized barrage rocket was the most effective. Tiny Tim, a blockbuster with oil well casing for a motor, was designed to pack a powerful punch against enemy pillboxes. These Caltech-developed rockets played an important role in American victory in Europe and in the Pacific during World War II. Meanwhile, construction activity at the new station was as frantic as the testing and training. Rocket propellant plants, homes, offices, laboratories, schools, 
and recreational facilities all began to take shape. During the war, plans had been developed to transfer Caltech weapon programs to the Navy. This transfer was well underway as the war drew to a close. About this time, construction was stopped on the huge new research and development laboratory at China Lake. A forceful case was being made for locating the station's R&D function near Pasadena. Shortly after the war ended, however, two very significant decisions were made. First, it was decided late in 1945 to complete the new laboratory at China Lake, a clear indication that the Navy was going ahead with the concept of a research and development work adjacent to the test ranges. Second, in October 1946, Admiral Hussey, chief of the Bureau of Ordnance, approved a charter of operations for the station. These principles of operation set the stage for building an outstanding military and civilian team. Unusual for a military installation was the delegation of control of the research and development work to a civilian technical director. The first technical director was Dr. L.T.E. Thompson. This able scientist and administrator firmly believed that the best weapons evolved from a military-civilian team with freedom and facilities to try new ideas quickly. Two major facilities were dedicated in May 1948. One was the variable angle launcher at the Pasadena Annex, where research and development effort was increasingly being directed to solving anti-submarine problems. This new facility became an important outdoor laboratory for studying water entry problems of torpedoes. Dr. Robert A. Milliken, head of Caltech, a famous physicist and Nobel Prize winner, officiated at the dedication of the other major facility, the new and important defense laboratory, named in honor of America's first Nobel laureate in physics, Albert Abraham Michelson. These 10 acres of labs, shops, and offices were to become the hub of research and development activity at China Lake. Thus, good facilities were being provided, and the intellectual and organizational climate was being established to attract and retain qualified technical personnel. By 1951, there were 1,000 scientists and engineers and 4,500 other civilian personnel attached to the station. 690 of the civilian scientists and engineers were at China Lake. The other 300 were at the Pasadena Annex of the station. It is significant that many of the young men and women recruited fresh from universities over the years became the research and development leaders in ordnance, both at the center and elsewhere. Thus, experience gained at the center has aided the nation's defense in many ways and in many places. Likewise, military personnel who served at the center spread information about the capabilities of the laboratory in their following tours of duty. Oftentimes, the many military alumni and other far-sighted officers helped to break administrative deadlocks, restraining R&D missions. The pressures of the Korean War soon tested the quick response capabilities of the laboratory. A weapon was needed, and fast, to destroy tanks with very heavy armor. The laboratory answer was a 6.5-inch shaped charge warhead and fuse for the 5-inch rocket motor. This anti-tank rocket could penetrate 18 inches of armor. Two hundred rounds were developed, produced, and shipped just 28 days after the request was received. The fleet could be supplied these weapons so quickly because the laboratory had the facilities and experience gained through years of applying the latest technology to operational problems. Also, during the closing days of the Korean War, limited quantities of the station developed 2.75-inch folding fin aircraft rocket Mighty Mouse were fired in combat with impressive results. The history of Mighty Mouse exemplifies several facts of good ordnance development. One such instance is its long, versatile life. Although designed originally to shoot down enemy jet bombers in shotgun-like salvos during pre-guided missile days, 
it has become primarily an air-to-ground weapon. Millions of them have been fired in Vietnam. Mighty Mouse illustrates another instance of good ordnance value. Development costs were relatively minor in relation to production costs of large quantities over the years. By 1968, two and a half billion dollars worth had been produced. Yet it cost only 14 million to develop, including the cost of pilot production. Helping to make the 2.75 a successful weapon in operational use was another station development, the Mark 16 aircraft fire control system. Introduced to the fleet in 1952, this daylight optical sight could be used to fire guns or rockets against any visible ground or air target. It was eventually installed in most Navy fighter aircraft. Although designed to be an interim system and phased out in 1953, it was still in use in 1968. Despite the success of rockets and fire control systems, it had become apparent to a few station scientists that the best way to knock down an enemy aircraft was to make the fire control system part of the rocket so it could guide the missile all the way to the target. Testing, redesign, fabrication of experimental hardware, and more testing finally gave way to spectacular flight tests of a fully equipped Sidewinder missile. Over the years, three versions of the Sidewinder were developed, put into production, and used by the Navy and Air Force. Early versions of Sidewinder are also in production abroad and in use by some of the NATO and CETO countries. Between 1945 and 1954, at the Salt Wells Pilot Plant, a little-known but exciting chapter in station history had been in progress. Here, in these buildings, built and put into operation by Dr. Bruce Sage. Carefully selected personnel were producing high explosive components for fission-type bombs. Then in 1954, when the Atomic Energy Commission terminated its operation at Salt Wells, the plant and other facilities built by the AEC became available for other station R&D work. Many other station facilities came into being the same way. Initially provided for one program, they were available for other important work. For example, many of the range facilities were installed for the testing of missiles in the Bumblebee program. The Bumblebee program started in 1945 and continued through several generations of more and more sophisticated radar, beam riding, ship to air intercept missiles until the conclusion of the test program 20 years later. Over the years, the station's image, as well as its physical appearance, has changed and grown. Through successes like Sidewinder, Knotts gained a great deal of freedom to plan its own programs. Naval officers rotated through the station have contributed valuable fleet experience to the station's image and have increasingly directed the attention of scientists and engineers toward fleet operational problems. Laboratory experience gained from observing strengths and weaknesses of earlier systems is a vital ingredient of the image. Coupled with knowledge of state-of-the-art advances in technology, these experiences have made it possible for imaginative and sometimes high-risk programs to be undertaken. Sometimes the design and the hardware were fine. For example, this soft landing vehicle. But the tests were failures. After doing everything asked of it, it committed suicide. Pasadena had its problems, too. As the image grew, the center gained the reputation as a place where hard jobs got done. For example, on America's number one deterrent weapon system, Polaris, the station had cognizance over the development and testing of underwater launching techniques. Eventually, difficult problems were solved, and another weapon was on its way to the fleet thanks to the application of special facilities and capabilities of industry and Navy laboratories.
In anti-submarine weapons, the lessons learned from the fleet applications of one weapon were applied to follow-on systems, just as was the case with air-to-air -air and air-to-ground weapons. The ASROC system, for example, was the third generation of rocket-thrown anti-submarine weapons developed by the laboratory. The station-developed Mark 46 homing torpedo is one of the ASROC payloads. People are an important part of the station image. The opportunity to do challenging research has attracted scientists outstanding in their fields. Many basic research people have made significant contributions in their professional fields. Also, they provide others with the intellectual stimulation and random access source of scientific knowledge, potentially valuable to defense problems, be they in space or under the sea. For example, the station proposed several unusual methods for placing satellites in orbit. Other station people, caught with the challenge of learning more about the sea, designed and built strange vehicles to explore and work in the deep ocean. Early in 1967, near Spain, Curve was used to recover a lost hydrogen bomb from a depth of 2,800 feet, a record for the recovery of an item from the deep sea. The station's image has been greatly enhanced by a concentration of attention on weapons for limited war. Some of the most successful have been modifications to stockpiled items. In one such project, opening fins were added to old bombs to make them safe for low-level delivery. In another project, different concepts were explored to solve difficult problems. And in still another, reliable systems were designed to counter sophisticated radar-directed anti-aircraft systems. By the time President John Kennedy visited China Lake in 1963, the station was recognized as the source of most of the nation's air weapons for use in limited wars. Bombs, rockets, and guided missiles in an impressive array were demonstrated to the president. was a lifetime highlight for everyone when they heard the young president say, I cannot think of a prouder statement when asked what our occupation may be than to say, I serve the United States of America. We want to thank all of you. Succeeding years saw a continuation of the now familiar pattern of design, development, test, redesign, and finally fleet introduction of new weapons. As the Vietnam conflict became more and more intense, pressures increased for fast solutions to operational problems. The station was quick to respond through a Vietnam laboratory assistance program. While some scientists and engineers at home worked to find solutions, others went to Vietnam for on-the-spot assistance to apply their experience and knowledge to large and small problems. In the midst of this heavy program of assistance to Southeast Asia operations, a major laboratory reorganization occurred July 1st, 1967. The Pasadena Laboratory was separated from China Lake operations at the same time the Naval Ordnance Laboratory Corona and China Lake Laboratories were combined and the name Naval Weapons Center applied. The work of the two laboratories had long been closely associated. Corona had developed fuses for China Lake missiles and had used China Lake test ranges in its other development programs. Combining the laboratories brought together in one organization most of the capabilities needed for the development of advanced air systems.
As part of the 25th anniversary commemoration of the center establishment, a panel discussion was held. At its conclusion, the panelists were asked their observation of 25 years of laboratory operation. Dr. Thompson commented on some of the salient features of the principles of operation promulgated in 1946. The management of the technical program was delegated to what was essentially a civilian organization. That did not say that there would not be an officer or several officers in the management structure. Uh, conceivably, even the, the senior member of that structure would be an officer, but it would be essentially the civilian organization that had the responsibility, largely because that is the area in which one could expect to get the backgrounds that are essential. At the same time, it provided for the uh, uh, assembly of groups of officers who had had special experience in the operations field, and particularly to collaborate in the operation, what we call operations research. Uh, the group of officers who have been at this station since the beginning, who were labeled or called experimental officers, now technical officers, is a very distinguished group. And we were talking today about the significance of their contributions to the program here. And also the significance of the program's contribution to their evolution. I think it works both ways. Admiral Burroughs acknowledged some of the people and the wartime circumstances that may have played decisive roles in shaping the plant and character of the laboratory. Well, I'm just very happy that I had something to do with getting this wonderful place started uh, with a lot of help from a great many people. We had a lot of advice and help from uh, a great many people besides uh, Dr. Thompson, whose contribution was tremendous, uh, <clears throat> Deke uh, Parsons, Admiral Parsons, uh, had a good deal to do with the thinking that uh, <coughs> uh, governed what actions we took in those early days. Among the many officers and Caltech scientists credited by Burroughs, some are seen in this early picture. Commander J.O. Richmond, first executive officer, and Dr. C.C. Lauritsen. Caltech's Director of Research on the Weapon Programs. Next to Burroughs is the first experimental officer, then commander, later Vice Admiral John Hayward. Dr. William G. Fowler, Caltech's Assistant Director of Research, who was directly responsible for much of the Knott's early work. And Dr. Emery Ellis, who supervised Caltech's range operations at Knott's. Dr. Ellis also spoke at the early timers meeting, along with Dr. E.C. Watson, who was the administrative head of Caltech's large wartime rocket program. The ideas and hardware that have come from the Knott's NWC laboratories have had enormous impact on free world defense capabilities. The people, facilities, and methods of operation of this laboratory are among the nation's best guarantees that our armed forces will have the best weapons possible to defend us.